So these are some images that come to mind when I think of black magic design. Um, you know, they're kind of like dominating. It's like, uh, black magic, please have mercy on us. Um, uh, the one interesting thing about black magic, if you didn't know, is they design and manufacture everything themselves, right? They're self-funded. Uh, there's no private equity company or VC connected with black magic. It's just the same people from, from day one. So it's, it's a unique company. Um, uh, and they partner with industry players while at the same time they're building out their own ecosystem. So they have this duality of working with Avid and working with other applications and especially imaging, imaging technologies now Resolve as kind of the go-to Swiss Army knife. If something comes out, uh, you really want Resolve to accommodate it, right? So you can scale your imaging technology. Um, so they're fulfilling their own destiny, in other words. Uh, their product line is insane. It's like, I don't know how they do everything from Ultimat to routing to standards conversion, 4K cameras, duplicators, disc recorders, storage, I.O. cards, monitoring, now IP products, right? Because um, if you guys haven't heard, the next big thing for our industry is our transition to IP, right? So we started with physical, then we transitioned to file, then we became server-based slash cloud, and the next big thing is the notion that all of us will be connected to the internet in a production-oriented way, in a post-production-oriented way. So even Blackmagic now has uh, IP equipment that just started recently. Um, and then, of course, everybody heard about these guys, um, the eGPU. So we had an opportunity to beta test the eGPU at work, and we decided to make a little video. So the importance of GPU processing as it relates to color correction is it powers the processing that we do. If we want to throw heavy effects, layers of grain, even just complicated node structures, then we need the GPU to perform. I started testing with the Blackmagic eGPU on an episode of The 100. All the same level of heavy color correction, facial refinement, numerous power windows, window tracking on numerous shots, and it played back real time every time. I tested a series of R3D clips, all 6K resolution, transcoded to ProRes 444. These clips had primary grades, secondary grades, tracking power windows, all played back in real time on an Apple MacBook Pro. I think it would be excellent to be on the front end of the process, going out into the field, sitting with the DP, and being able to set a color with the DP right there while he's shooting. Rendering 4K, 6K, 8K clips on my Apple MacBook Pro with the Blackmagic eGPU is twice as fast as what I was getting before. You know, I got great performance on a laptop hooked up to a mini panel and just a simple two terabyte SSD drive. It's a game changer. Yay, eGPU. So now I'll move on. Um, Final Cut, 15, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Resolve 15 is what I wanted to talk about. And I'm going to try to pick up speed uh, in the presentation because I actually got feedback from all our staff and departments in terms of what Resolve means to them. Um, and uh, so that, that had no resonance with you guys? Because, you know, Grant, Grant was working with Apple all along. There was always this vision that you bring all these departments, all these disciplines under one umbrella, and Apple was well on their way. So look what's happened, right? It's, um, it's quite remarkable. So Resolve 15, we go from $1.2 million to 999 to 299 and free, right? Um, it's everywhere. Right, I've, I've had a chance to travel around the world. It's remarkable that everywhere I go, Resolve is there. Just like Final Cut was. <clears throat> when I used to travel, Final Cut was everywhere. So uh, the big difference, though, between the Apple Pro apps and what Resolve is doing today is that Resolve essentially is one platform. So even when they acquire like a Fairlight or a Fusion, which are fully competent applications, they somehow just shoved all those guts into <laughs> Resolve, and it's under one umbrella. And obviously, if you look at it practically, that's a trajectory. It takes a long time to 
to rewrite that code, to optimize that code, and put it under one application. But the one thing I know, it's under one team, right? And that's distinctly different than how Apple did it. Um, so almost imperceptibly, even for us, like when, when the Resolve team mentioned to us that they were going to do editing, I think most of us said, why? You know, we, we, we just didn't see the potential as, as they did. Um, but over the last few years, it's become a fully capable nonlinear editor um, and ever improving. Um, it's, it's our conform tool, soup to nuts. We don't use anything else. We don't round trip in any other applications. We don't care if you did your project on Sony Vegas. We are going to conform it and resolve, right? And we'll take that hit on the front end so that we can reap all the benefits of having Resolve be the one place that we finish across all departments. So it's a VFX tool. It's an audio editing tool. It's a media organizer. It's something that we deliver from. Um, and, and it brings all those disciplines under one application. In, in a sense, Resolve 15 is probably the most excited I've been, personally, since Final Cut 7, um, where you felt like you were part of something momentous, something that was above average. So Resolve is everywhere. It's in our theater. It's in our bays. Um, and this is, uh, for, for those of you who like it, I, I thought I'd bring some hardware porn to, to the party. <laughs> Um, so this is not the latest, but this is one system that we built recently. Uh, and these are the exact specs, but it's a super micro. And um, it's a beast. I mean, it's a, it's a Linux-based system, but now supercomputing looks something like that. And I know many people around the world are doing their own custom hardware. Um, there's a lot of people who provide hardware that's optimized for Resolve, so you can just buy it and go. Um, but we, we love to experiment with the latest hardware technologies because that bad boy right there, we built a, a new system that has two of them. Those are like $9,000 each. That's painful to purchase. It's super expensive, but uh, that system right now represents the fastest system that we've ever used. And, and working with Peter and the team, um, we're able to achieve astounding performance. You know, it's not really uh, a statement saying I do real time 8K. So what? It's about it's about having complex timelines, right? With a lot of complexity, creative complexity, film grains, and have that run in a real environment with clients. That's what we're talking about. That's why we're so excited. And of course, I just stuck this in there today because. GPU now is the new center of gravity, right? The Resolve is constantly reworking Resolve to be more GPU-oriented, uh, dependent. So, um, so I guess you would say they bet the farm on GPU. And um, just a little investment advice, uh, NVIDIA is doing exceptionally well. <laughs> so um, I bought their stock. Um, Patrick, who I mentioned, he has one of these at home, right? Um, Patrick, in addition to working at Digital Film Tree, he also does a shit ton of commercial work. He runs his own business, just like every colorist, right? Um, they, they run uh, uh, businesses based on their geography, based on existing relationships. So it's completely common now to, to have something like this at home. In the same way, Final Cut introduced that idea all those years ago, where you can have an editor a union editor cutting at home in his underwear, right? That was an achievement. You know, when, when, when one of the Scrubs editors called me and said, I can't believe I'm doing this at home. Yeah, I remember that. That was a milestone because that was unheard of. That was unthought of. Um, the panels, right? The fact that you can now afford a panel because the panel they had for all those years was rather expensive. But we're talking about the democratization of post-finishing and color at home. So without spending too much time, um, one of the coolest things we're doing right now is just based on the notion that we will bring the finishing process to where you are physically, right? Not the representation of the finishing process that happens in a real bay with an H.264 or something like that, or some kind of transmission or some kind of really cool lossless technology or anything of the sort, 
we, we've endeavored to actually traffic the camera files to all the relevant locations, which again goes back to IP logistics. Resolve is actually the fun, easy part of it, but trafficking securely camera raw to two locations, right? Where I can present you the color process and present you the conform process, even visual effects drop-ins. And that's gonna be part of the demonstration later in terms of how Resolve now is touching all departments. Um, but this is what we do. Right, that's our, 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 our current relevance. We, we bring the post-production process to where you are. When you see it, it's exactly what you would see in a brick and mortar post house. There's a question. That's a great question. So he's asking about the difference between like a super duper monitor that might be at the location versus what they have. Yeah. yeah. Y yes. Uh, so the, the, the big development there is LG OLED, my friend. Um, so we've been going through this limbo period where the Panasonic plasmas were the de facto standard for any, any post house. Um, by the way, we, we had to buy those Sony uh, X300s that are now $51,000 for the second generation. Um, but uh, we use those uh, primarily for HDR projects. But it's staggering when you put that $51,000 monitor. And again, we have a team of at least three different color scientists that all routinely calibrate and manage our color science in addition to our internal staff. And that $51,000 monitor versus something you can buy on a consumer market for as low as $1,600, usually around $2,500, is amazing. It's, uh, it's just unbelievable. And that's, there's a little mini revolution going on right now because we, we explicitly trust the LG OLEDs. And Panasonic, for example, has the same monitor, but it has Panasonic on it. By, yeah, it's like a markup because they put their sauce on it. Um, I like Panasonic, they're cool. Um, but it's the same panel, right? So if you endeavor to, to go through the calibration process with the proper individuals, that right there is, is uh, a big deal. Um, so we, we securely connect all these productions to the internet. That's our job, that's the first step. Um, as you know right now, the biggest liability in, in media entertainment is security. Uh, just about everyone has been breached. Um, even the last HBO breach didn't get a lot of attention, but you, you're, you're talking about a situation where scripts were lifted historically and current. Um, uh, there's been shows lifted. It, that's the biggest thing right now. So post-workflow, well and good. The challenge is security, right? How do you commingle? security policy with a creative workflow. That's probably the most challenging thing we do for a living. <clears throat> so just to break out the dailies portion, this is the exact workflow we have for a show called Rect, where we do the dailies remotely from Fiji, which is by far the most ambitious uh, location we've ever done, because the, uh, the internet in Fiji really sucks. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's variable, it's intermittent. Uh, it actually is a line that comes to the ocean, um, but we're using it, um, uh, you know, leveraging all the IP tools and you know, layer two technologies to, to, to deal with our pain points. We also have invested some time in some hardware and software development to create you know, uh, media specific VPN tunneling, right? Uh, secure tunnel for us, for our needs, not for some other IT industry need, but for what we need and for the specifications that are mandatory. Um, obviously, everything has become you know, about security policy. Uh, just like Netflix, we are zero. It's, it's now all about zero trust. You have a situation now where you've been working with someone for 15 years and you cannot just give them the file anymore. It's crazy um, because someone will find out about it. right? So you have to apply the same security policy uh, summarily, across everyone you interact with, you have to whitelist everybody, right? Even people you know, you have to whitelist them. So the only people that can get in are the people that are whitelisted and they go through a specific security policy. Um, 
jumping to remote color. So when we first started doing remote color, it used to be for productions in Vancouver, North Carolina, you know, stuff far away, Prague, um, uh, New York. But once we started getting pretty good at it, especially the IT part, the security part of it, um, our, our clients said, hey, can I use it? I'm just down the road. So, so American Housewife was the first time we did remote color for a production that was just a, bit, a little bit more than a mile away from us. And um, that's a dynamic where the DPs, regardless of where they are physically, they still don't have time, right? But they want to check in on, the, on their work, on, on what they've imaged, and we're now able to do that, present them the exact same thing that the colorist is coloring, but they get to see it whether they're a mile away or if they're in Fiji. Uh, Resolve for conform and editing. So it used to be that we use Resolve for remote dailies and remote color. Then we were uh, essentially, we were the people that had our hands up with the, with the Da Vinci team saying, hey, can't we do it across the post spectrum? And guess what? They started doing it. So now, <laughs> Now we do remote conform, which is insane. I mean, we've never done that before. So, so let's say you're an AP, you're not a DP, and you're, you're, you're basically tending to the timeline, to making sure everything is done as it should be, including titling and everything that goes into conform. Now we can present that to you at home or in your office, right? Because the AP is also important. Um, the co-producer, all the people that have to tend to the other parts of the post process. OK, I have to pick up speed here. So um, we did a little video. And again, all the videos I'm showing you, this is the first time we've shown them publicly. So I hope you like them. Remote Post started with dailies. And then uh, as the tools evolve, we started doing Remote Post for color, which was really fantastic to connect colorists with DPs. And now that's evolving further to do online sessions, a lot of reviews, VFX drop-ins, title review sessions. A good example of Remote Post is the show The 100. We have producers that are in different locations that might not be able to get into an edit bay or into a color bay. For me here in Santa Monica, I can work with Thomas over in Digital Film Tree or Tim, the director on The 100. He works in Newport Beach and he can have a color session as if he was in Digital Film Tree. And same for me. The time it saves over the course of a season, God, if I can calculate that, it allows us to do so much more in a shorter amount of time. I can call Thomas at any point. He can just say, hey, E, I'm ready for you. I literally run down the hall, turn on the monitor, and we get to work. Hi, E, how's it going? Hey, what's up, man? I have a uh, VAM review for you. Is there anything you want to go over before our review? No, let's just get rolling. What's unique about how Digital Film Tree does remote post is you're not looking at a, a live stream of the timeline. You're not looking at a semblance of the timeline. You're looking at the actual timeline. We have two projects that are essentially in sync with each other. And instead of transmitting video signals back and forth, we're sending commands. Let's say I resize a shot on my system. It will immediately be in sync on the remote location. Would you like me to blow it up a little bit? Maybe. Let's see how it moves. Maybe I can blow it up just a little bit more. Can you, can you roll into it? Yep. We just have so many different versions on a big VFX show like this. They're going to give us versions that we have notes on, so we go back and forth with the VFX company. Every time we drop in a shot to our timeline, we can have anywhere from like 130 versions of a shot. I can toggle back and forth between a finished shot, the old shot. I can decide if I like the new shot better. It's all sitting in this timeline. I'm actually seeing the real full res version of the shot. Speed is always a factor when delivering a show. And when time is of the essence, remote post seems to be the, the only method to keep up with the current delivery schedule. When you sit in your color bay or you sit in your edit bay and you're working with the clients, you get to be a part of the overarching show. And that's fantastic. When I think about it, the, the way we used to do it back then and how we're doing it now, it's mind boggling because it's so much more efficient now that it is in the finished state every time we do drop-ins and notes. Now I understand what work-life balance means because I have it. So re really important note that this, this clip-based workflow that, that we've evolved to is essentially being in a constant state of finish, right? It's not that you finish something and then you go through some other process to be finished, right? Another department, another application. So that, that has been a profound 
change for us. That's like a sea change. So when you finish something with a client, you're actually done. In fact, we had to go through just the psychology with the clients to go, you're actually done, done. They're like, are you sure? They're like, yeah, yeah, that's it. So um, I'm going to uh, talk quickly about Resolve for Offline. How many people here are using Resolve for creative offline editing in earnest? OK, that's, a, that's actually a lot more than I expected. So we're interested in your plight, right? Like how you're doing. Um, we're, we we want to know, right? So if if uh, if you're running into challenges or whatever, call Digital Film Tree. We're actually very interested in people that are doing that right now, um, as we were interested in people that would entertain Final Cut back in the day. It feels similar, um, and we've invested a lot to make that a successful effort. Um, because I'm out of time, if anyone is interested in color collaboration, take a screen grab of that. Those are raw notes from two of our senior colorists, Dan Judy and, and Rick Dobby, who's right here. So uh, really quickly, Roseanne was tag teamed by uh, Dan and Rick. Um, they both worked on that project, and they fully leveraged the collaboration capabilities of Resolve. And if you thought sitcoms were easy, well, they used to be. But <laughs> that's the note structure for one scene. And just take a screen grab of that, because we don't have time. But that was just one scene, because Roseanne was uh, strangely complicated for a sitcom, right? Her arms were brown. We had to rotoscope everything. I mean, we had to track everything. And we had to do a lot of work in a very short amount of time. Um, go back? OK, sure. Oh, this one? And remind, remember, when this show, when the revival came out, you basically had a situation, a show lived for nine seasons. We digitized all nine seasons. And every season looked different, right? So one season looked magenta, one season looked green. The producers had a romantic memory of what they thought the show was like. But it was like, <laughs> no, no, that's, that's it. That's, that's what it looked like. They're like, nope, that, that's not. So that was complex, right? You have nine seasons, and you're trying to come up with a fresh new look, right? That's where even sitcoms can be super complicated. Resolve is the best tool in the world, period, for that. Um, we now have this brand new category called color effects, because you know, Resolve is mixing it up, right? So I can be in a color session, and I can track something with the same precision, precision as the visual effects department. So we started trying to figure out how to do this, because now visual effects is using Resolve. And then the color people are using Resolve. So we actually figured it out by standardizing our color and visual, uh, uh, color and visual effects rate to be the same. So the client doesn't care if we kick it down to visual effects or stay in color. Because oftentimes, the prices are different. The client goes, I don't want to go to visual effects. I want to do it here, because it's cheaper. So we, we actually standardize our pricing for visual effects and color because they are oh so ever commingling. Um, take a picture of this. This is uh, uh, Robert Allison. He's in charge of our dubbing and deliveries. These are his personal notes in terms of why he likes Resolve. And we actually use Resolve as part of the delivery process. We don't go through an intermediary. We go right from the timeline to any delivery that needs to be made, right? And, and uh, uh, Robert actually wears ties. He's weird. Um, that was just a day at work. He, did, he decides to dress like that. That has nothing to do with me. Um, we don't even have time to talk about Fairlight, but we have a competent audio application. And, and I don't think the intention was to go after Pro Tools or whatnot. It's just the idea that you have this there. So you can do things routinely, like 5-1 mixes and all kinds of you know, even uh, incidental audio work, because we're not an audio house, but it's now a utilitarian tool that's there. So we use it, and it's actually kind of cool. Um, take a picture of that. Those are notes from Peter Chamberlain. In talking to him more and more in terms of what he is uh, most excited about, it's audio. <laughs> so with everything that they're doing, you know, and we're not even an audio house, but they think that that is uh, uh, the, the kind of the center of gravity, because it's uncommon to have one application that also has audio, as well as visual effects and can form. This is, this is potentially an unprecedented moment in media history, right? So is it buggy? Yeah, it, it, totally. But, um, 
It's coming along. I mean, was, fi was Final Cut buggy? Absolutely, right? Uh, but we just kind of bled our way there. And if you're so inclined, uh, jump into Fairlight. So um, again, this is all about um, resolving pain points in the production and post industry. Um, Resolve is already creating and will create many more interdisciplinarians, right? This is the idea that a colorist dabbles with audio and editing and visual effects, that editors dabble with audio, color, and visual effects, and that audio folks just dabble in general. <laughs> this, is, this is exponential collaboration that is in front of us folks. Um, do we have time to show the last video? Sure. Okay. So this is, <laughs> this is a hodgepodge of about four different videos we did. So this is just a generalized collabor uh, Resolve collaboration video. Collaborative workflow is us as editors, colorists, VFX people, audio people, contributing to the product at the, at the very end to be the best sounding looking picture that it can be. They broke down the barrier between sound, edit, and color. So you can have colorists working on the same timeline as editors, working on the same timeline as uh, sound designers. We can build so many different looks and worlds. We used to be limited by, we had one power window, and if you wanted a blow up, you'd have to go back to online, and you, it would take half hour, 45 minutes just to get back to where you want to be. Working with our colorists, our VFX editors, and our delivery team on the same timeline allows for big time flexibility because I can be doing one thing with Thomas, run down the hall, talk to Dan about a color note we had, give it back to Thomas, and we're done. Every one of us could be working on the exact same project at the exact same time. Once Edit's got it started, you can come in and a half an hour later and start working. Remote workflow, then we would take that and present that to the client, wherever they want to be. Television production these days is all about time and being fast and efficient, and so you have to learn to choose your battles. It helps me be efficient and fast on set, knowing the tools I have available to me. Typically, network broadcast production moves at such a rapid pace that it's very hard to get a cinematographer to come back into the color bay because they're on set day after day. So remote colors really freed us up to regain that collaboration that, that we've traditionally always had. One example, we were having a, a really hard time with the visual effects shot. Uh, it was a shot that I wasn't happy with, the producers weren't happy with. During lunch one day, I'm in there, I'm happy with it, I'm sold. I'm like, this is great. And I said, well, wait a minute, I, I can literally walk outside the door right now and all three showrunners, line producers were standing right outside the door. And I said, guys, can you come and look at this? We need you to sign off. And they came and they looked at it, they go, this is real, this is right now? I go, yeah, and they go, this is amazing, and sold. It's gonna save me 10 to 20 hours on a week, I'd say. That work all has to get done, so that's just a direct you know, savings to me and my team. At the end of the day, you want to work with the best people anywhere in the world. You know, it's not, we're not no longer restricted to one locale. We can utilize those tools to collaborate more and to spend more time creatively uh, uh, finishing your project. So what is the magic that makes all this collaboration possible? It's a simple Postgres database. Um, Currently, it works in local environments. Anyone can stand it up, and you can join all your collaborators on a single subnet and do all this stuff, right? What's that? Lights up. Oh, lights up. Yeah. I was like, I thought you were flipping me off. No, no, no. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> like, screw you, man. <laughs> No, you know, it's, it's ironic. Um, Resolve fully lives outside of any cloud anything. It's, uh, you know, look, to their credit, they built something that's robust that will work in rigorous environments, and there's, you know, it has no cloud aspect. It's a local database, and it's reliable and robust. Now, if you want to extend that, you have to uh, do a lot of other work, right? Um, but but it's, the, it's the database that makes this all possible. And it's only been around for like, uh, Thomas, how long has this been around? About a couple years, right? I mean, 
we, we started using it in, in the first beta, and three, so two going on three years. So this is not like a development that's been going on for a long time. This is relatively recent. And, and Black Magic has also confirmed that the majority of what is a multi-million user base for Resolve either don't even know about this or don't do anything like this. So this is just kind of heads up that this is there. It's relatively mature. Um, we're trafficking you know, well over a dozen TV shows through this collaborative process, and it works without cloud. Right? Even though we're cloud centric, oh shit, I was not supposed to say that. Even though we're <laughs> server centric, um, you don't have to be, right? And the, so you have collaboration across episodes, collaboration across departments. And in closing, uh, what my inspiration was for the way we do business is a class at Stanford, which I've been associated with. I've been uh, evangelizing it for many years. So people who've heard this, sorry if you're hearing it again. But uh, this class started in 1969. It's called ME310. And it was premised on this idea that you bring teams together that are from different disciplines. So you bring a sociologist, a computer scientist, a creative, which they call the fuzzies, a uh, sociologist. And then you give them one crazy, hard challenge, right? Something that's mind numbing. And you give them the whole year to iterate on a prototype. And, um, you know, companies like Google came out of there, right? Um, you're talking about innovation across medical, uh, car, oil. It's because it's been proven that if you have people that normally do not hang out together, like an IT person and, and an After Effects artist, that something good will come out of that. And I'm a testament that we're still in business after 18 years based on this idea. And, and you need an interdisciplinary environment because our, our production and post world has gotten ever more complicated. So people that normally don't hang out together, people that normally don't speak within it, uh, with each other should, right? And, and things will become better. So that's it.